Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter Select, a seasonal retrospective podcast where we bounce back and forth between a series exploring its evolution, design, and legacy. For this season, season five, we are covering the Resident Evil franchise. My name is Max Roberts, and I am joined, as always, by Logan Moore. Hi, Logan. We've reached a point that I never expected to reach. Not saying I didn't think we'd reach this episode and do this, but Resident Evil 6, I had resigned that I would just never play this video game. And here we are. Mm -hmm. I've now played it. Carried, dragged each other across the finish line. It truly was a cooperative experience of, you know, one, one member would fall and be like, I can't go on anymore, this game. And the other would say, no, we have to do it and drag us across the finish line. And quite literally, I literally had to carry you across the finish line of the final campaign because you couldn't Uh, do anything. This is true. I couldn't open any doors. I was a figment of Ada Wong's imagination. Uh, And we we are going to talk about all of that. But yeah, we are. We're here. We played Resident Evil 6, the nearly the death of the franchise. Yeah, I mean, like, sort I mean, of. I mean, I feel like it's it's too it, it was too, it's too big to fail. It's almost sure, like we we're just sure. talking about but Fast that, and Furious. It was, like, <laughs> it's the, it was the death of that era for sure. It was definitely sure, yes. it definitely caused like a, a resuscitation in the franchise. <laughs> just like what's weird is like I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about with this game, and I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but like there are still games in this style that have come about. That came about afterwards, you know, with like the Revelations games and stuff like that, which aren't as action driven. They are a little bit more at the roots of older style Resident Evil. But but yeah, this for the mainline series. Yes, this caused them to go rethink some things once again. Um, Yeah, go go sit in the corner and think about what you've done, Capcom kind of mentality and what's funny is and i'm pretty sure we've noted this over the course of this season but a lot of the people involved with this game have also worked on a lot of the other games in recent years so it's not like this game was made by like a b team within capcom or anything it was just as george lucas says in the uh and the i don't know if you've ever watched that like episode one documentary that exists where it talks about how they made that movie but i think at one point he sees like the final cut of the movie the final like raw cut and he says i may have gone too far in a few places <laughs> and that's kind of what they did with this game they just went <laughs> too far and they needed to reel themselves back in a smidge a little bit of a smidge but just a little bit uh let's do the quick rundown here and then we'll get into talking about this game more ad nauseum because there is uh, quite a bit to break down to be honest um Once again, developed and published by Capcom, Uh, Resident Evil 6 originally released on PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and it also came to PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. It launched on October 2nd, 2012. The game director was Aichiro Sazaki. The producer was Yoshiaki Hirabayashi. That's an interesting one. And then uh, the music was done by Ehiko Narita. And then this game has a Metacritic score. I want to note this. You noted the Metacritic score here for the PlayStation 3 Uh, version. I was going to bring this up, yes. Well, the the, yeah, so the PlayStation 3 version has a 74 out of 100 Metacritic score. The 360 version, though, which has almost double the reviews, has a 67. So it's about a 7, 70 in there, you know, after you average the two, I suppose. Yeah. The PC version also, I think, is like at 69 or something. So nice. It's in there. And then the user scores are also like in the five range, which I know doesn't matter on Metacritic. Who cares about user scores? But by all accounts, this is the worst game in the series. <laughs> We've never had one this low. It's it's rare that we play any games this low, period, on this show, I feel so like. So far, yeah. So far we've played, well, Paper Mario had its times. Paper Mario had some, had some down times Banjo, for sure. Banjo-Kazooie had its dark day. It did. But, so. uh... It's rare for us to do an episode about a game that is considered outright, you know, not Mid. great or bad, you know, yeah. so, which is, again, why I mentioned at the top of the show, I never thought I would play this game. I just, you know, this was the one we had, this was the one we had circled at the start of the season is like, oh, that'll be an interesting one when we yeah, finally that do will, that. It, it, and it was, it really, really was. We 
did the same thing that we did with Resident Evil 5, which I actually, before the season started, I didn't think we would play both games entirely cooperatively. I thought at points we would we would play separately and then and come back together. But we did play every level, every chapter together the whole mm-hmm. time. That's a lot of game. We got all the serpent emblems. We showed did. you we where all of them tro- were. We popped that trophy together through thick and thin. Even so. it, and we even replayed the levels because some of them were one character only to our chagrin. Let's start there. I think that's actually really good. Well, I mean, just broadly, this is a bad game, correct? Oh, it's trash. Yes, it's not good. <laughs> I mean, jumping off the Metacritic score here, I know we talked, you did at least at the end of the, or in the last episode we did, which was all about Resident Evil 5, you're like... I just want to say it. I want to say it now. I want to preserve it for the record. I am excited to play Resident Evil 6. Okay. I am excited to play Resident Evil 6. And I was like, okay, we'll see how long that lasts. And that first level or two, when you were learning about the mechanics and like the things you can do in this game, you were pretty hyped. And then the same thing happened to you that happened to me the first time I played this game, which was like the levels just beat you down with like... (laughs) They grind you to a nub. I think it's the game design more than anything, which, I mean, we can get we can get it deeper into why I think this game is bad. Um, that'll be the whole point of <laughs> this That's podcast. That's what this episode is for. <laughs> yes. Um, did you, I got to ask though, did you play this at launch? Because you were into Resident no, Evil no, back no, no, in no, 2012. No. You, yeah, I was. So you I stayed had played, away from it? I had played all of them, yeah, up until five, and I had obviously... Yeah, I was like a huge Resident Evil fan. And then I saw this was coming out. I was like, oh, crap. They just announced six. Oh, my gosh. I remember, um, I I want to say I was at my girlfriend's house when they announced it. And I was like on my phone. And I was like, whoa, Resident Evil 6. And I watched the trailer. And I'm like, that looks cool. And then <laughs> uh, I don't remember what else. But I just remember like reviews came out. And everybody's like, it sucks. And I was like, oh. I'm not touching this then because okay. it was it, it was during that era where you know don't have a lot of money. I'm in high school. I'm working at a minimum wage job. Got to be a little bit select. Like I had expendable income, but not to the point where you know I'm buying every game. every game that's coming out. So when I saw that it was trash, I was like, I will save my money now. Okay, and uh, right. just never got it back around to to getting it. So I got you. Okay, I obviously. You never, never did, touched you know. it at all. I I always had heard things about you know this being the downfall of the series, like, and especially when Seven come, came out and rebooted everything, you know, style wise. Well, that's the thing. It, for, it made the, for, it made Seven stand out more critically. So I've always our Six stand out more critically. So I, yeah, I've always heard of it, but I've never never experienced it. Never really understood what the game was or tried to do, and and now I know. <laughs> well, just to mention this again, I think I've mentioned this already in this season so i'm sorry if i'm repeating myself but yeah like i had obviously i did play seven at launch i did play village at launch so i had played every game in the series except for this one and so it was just like sitting there as the one i was like dude i should play this game just to say i've played all of them you know it was kind of it hung over me for the past decade to be honest because of that um (laughs) and a few years ago our friend michael ruiz and i decided to play it and that was my previous experience with it we played through the Chris campaign and about half of the Leon campaign. And then we got about halfway through that Leon campaign and just bounced. And uh, so I did have prior experience before doing it here for the show, but I had never gone back. Um, We played through the full game together here. Um, So, yeah, I, I, I want to ask you the thing I want to ask you before though, um, because we have played both five and six together Let's do the same thing we did in our five episode, which is just talk about this game's merits as a co-op title and how do you think they kind of expanded on what was in five and how you think the experience was of us playing this one together. It's interesting. I feel like they made some gameplay regressions in the co-op sense. There is no giving of items between players at really any point there's no healing like group healing right i don't recall us ever like standing next to each other and spraying a uh, first aid spray i mean when you're on the ground you know you can give me some little yes my little 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 pellets so that was interesting that they they isolate you that way 
and don't let you kind of intermingle. That also like item pickups are different for each other. Like when we break a box, what you see and what I see are two different items. As far as mm-hmm. I can tell, you'd be like, yep. oh, I got skill points again. And I'm like, I got pistol ammo. So that it's hard. Like to, it's not- hard to like call out in the environment like, oh, there's some shotgun ammo over here if you need it or there's because that's right. what it was in five. Because like mm-hmm. I knew, you know, that you're running a machine gun style character and I'm running a shotgun. So if there's shotgun and ammo in the environment in five when we're playing you'd be like oh this is over here for you you should come get this or and in this game there's none of that and we have the same weapons the entire time except for you in the first couple of campaigns because of your previous experience (laughs) yeah so that was it's it's separate but together like we're just existing in not even the same world because of those item differences but we just we're going side by side and there are doors at certain points where it just requires both of us to open it so it's it's like a single player co-op game. Mm-hmm. It's it kind of reminds me of Stick with Me Destiny in a way where like I can go off and do my own thing in the shared world and you go do something in the shared world and sometimes we come together to complete an objective or, or fight a boss and I'm specifically just speaking of the open parts of Destiny not so much going on a raid together or a you know um different task in that game. So separate but together yeah, it's a little bit like, um, kind of remind me more of like Left 4 Dead. Okay. That's kind of what I was thinking, where it's like, the goal is just to mow down zombies, and you work best mowing down zombies, you know, when you're working together, sure. but you don't have to. Like, somebody can play hero and go run around and do their own thing, and that's kind of what it felt like to me. But even Left 4 Dead, like, you know, there's consistent items throughout the environment you know like oh there's this over here and there yeah it was very strange that we both had different items appearing in each of our own playthroughs i'm, I'm not sure what the decision was for that and then yeah some of the the removal of some of the um things that were in five yeah i, I just I, I guess that's the thing that i'm most confused about with this game is that there were already elements of five that were present and worked well and then they just removed them and I'm not sure what the decision was to remove them, you know, mm-hmm. swapping swapping inventories between us. Like, you need this? Cool. Here you go. And um, the inventory system as a whole we can talk about as well. Oh, is, we will. Like, it's horrible in this game. It's probably the worst one in the whole series, I would say. Like, It fills up very quickly. It's hideous. Yes. Like, it it's a wheel. Is, the wheel in Chris's campaign is probably the worst. Like that circle UI is so mm-hmm. confusing and it, it, you can't man, everything's linear. It's almost like you an can't. XMB, like the PS3 yes. XMB. So you can't, you're not moving things around like to make space or whatever, but you, you have to put things together or drop items, but your, your grenades are on a, the vertical row instead of the horizontal. It's a, it's an remember when they when, remember when the PS5 first came out and they changed how trophies were displayed and everybody's like why did you do this like you we can't see the information like we can't see anything now that's mm-hmm. what this felt like to me like they had every other Resident Evil game has had a pretty good inventory system where you can see everything that you have on your character at a single time through the press of a single button and now you're like cycling through everything you have and you're having to trying to trying to figure out oh i found magnum ammo here on the ground but what should i what do i have on me and what should i drop and you're like ah and you're like scrolling through tabbing through everything it, yeah. it's like it's 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 terrible i i don't know and that and that's what that's the strange thing is like there are so many pillars of this game you know that are core to the resident evil series but they just went for the worse in this game you know and the inventory system is a big one it almost feels like they tried to shake things up a little bit or reinterpret things for the sake of it. Instead of refining or enhancing something, these all felt, nothing felt additive in a mechanical sense, or I should say in the traditional sense, you know, mm-hmm. the staples of the series. There are some new things in this game that I actually think are great on a gameplay level that work super well both as just a third person shooter but also as a, a co-op shooter and, and things like that but this ui really drove me batty and i'm I, I will say i did like the aesthetic choice of having each character have their own ui 
Yeah. That fit thematically with what's going on, especially like Jake and Sherry having their UI swapped because their phones were taken away and like broken in the campaign. So your UI switched based off the narrative. That was cool. It reminded me of uh, uh, Sheva being only uh, left-handed. Left-handed, the whole game yeah. And sticking with that. So this was kind of a cool world-building thing. It's just they chose like the most obtuse UI possible, and I yes. don't. I it was frustrating to manage it. You and I were talking about this before the show started about another video game series, but it kind of reminded me of this. I, I think a lot of times when new games or sequels come out, people want things to be different just for the sake of being different, and I'm guilty of that. You know, like a like for instance. Uh, like Jedi Survivor just came out, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, and like I thought it was a really good game, and I had fun with it. But you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, well, this isn't like this is like J- Star Wars Fallen Order one point five. Like I don't really feel like there's a lot of changes. But then I play something like this, and I see how many changes they do made, they did make, and they were all for the worse. And it's like, oh, you should have just kept a lot of what was in five like why did you alter this and like it's not flashy i guess to come into a sequel with certain elements that have not been tweaked or changed very much i know that's and that's something that's been getting criticized a lot more i want to say like with the playstation side of things like i know people were criticizing like ragnarok leading up to that game's release like this just looks like the same one they're even using the same animations and stuff like oh my which was oh, <laughs> ridiculous and over the top but like yeah. this game yeah the change this game i guess just shows to me like you don't want sequels to be fully altered in every manner because it can get worse there's a fine line right now look at this you know sticking with resident evil look at 7 or look at the jump from 3 to 4 yeah those are sequels that do revamp the series entirely from a mechanical and, and presentation perspective for the better so it, it there's differences though between you know like between six and seven like you're you're jumping genres at that point not horror but like for third to first person and stuff like that right like you're changing like huge elements of those games to where they're completely different from one another and a lot a lot's going to get tweaked in the process though but like yeah. five to six they're both still you know action third person shooters yeah, it, 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 with co-op elements at the end of the day so it's kind of what we've talked about, We, or at least I've pieced together throughout this whole season and through this series of games, is Resident Evil is kind of in different eras. And there's the mm-hmm. kind of the zero through three era that eases into the Code Veronica through six era, more action heavy, less horror focused, those types of things, co-op eventually. And then now we're in the, the you know, the seven through presumably nine era coming up here in however many years and the remakes are sprinkled in there but a new style of game and visual and and gameplay mechanics and stuff and this is just the end of that action co-op era and it it definitely feels like a ps3 era game ps3 360 it's big it's flashy tries to be at least and it just doesn't it tries too much that doesn't land and that brings other pieces crumbling down if it was just the inventory and the mechanic side that wasn't good but the story was great or the visuals were dope you know that they could compensate or carry but each kind of section of this game is a, is a missing apart has a crack in the foundation and then the whole thing comes crumbling down by the end of it yeah i yes i totally agree with you there's a lot of areas we could go with this so let's just kind of stick with where we're at you know talking about some of the stuff that was changed and one thing I other thing I did want to ask you was just, you know, the herb system in this game and the health system as a whole, having the different blocks of health and that uh, was part combining. of the inventory problem, right? You yeah. pick up an herb and it would take up a whole box and you would just get all these herbs and then you'd have to mix them, but it's only red and uh, red and green. You mix them together and they turn into pills, and one pill fills up one health block. And you have six health blocks. And you can put a pill, put the pills in your dispenser, but your dispenser also caps out at like twelve. And for me, it was like sixteen or seventeen or something weird like that. You maybe you had a perk, a skill that maybe bumped that maybe. up, but it was twelve for me for sure, at least in the final uh, in the Jake campaign because I remember filling okay. that up and 
leaving it. But then there's also first aid spray, but that exists on the vertical column instead of the horizontal, which is where the herbs existed. So it's this <laughs> weird... And so if you combine two greens, you get, I think, three. And if you combine that with another one, you then get six. So like the math doesn't necessarily add up either. And then a red and a green automatically gives you six pills. And so it's just one to one. There's no, this fills your health up halfway. This fills up your health all the way. It is, you're just managing how many pills you produce, I suppose. Yeah. And I did not, I did not like that at all personally like i just prefer the broad like see this is the first game i can think of where you can see your health kind of laid out in that direct of a manner am i correct because all of the others obviously you have or well i guess with the remakes you can see your health um but with or well yeah with the other games i'm just a health bar what, yeah, it did, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like it would just say fine, caution, or danger. There was not an exact, you know, no four bar did, to go off of. Four had an exact bar because the yellow herbs you could increase the bar. That's right. That no, that's true. You're totally right. Yes, yes, you're absolutely so, right. I think from four onward, I would think five had a health bar. I would think. Yeah, it did. I don't know what I'm talking about. So no, it absolutely did. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm wrong. Yeah, there's I'm wrong a health on that bar. Point. I'm looking at a picture of it. Yeah, it was yes, green there is the circle, very Kingdom Heartsy. It's it's just, I think the difference is there's two things I think that make this more frustrating. It's finite in the sense that your health is very segmented, six blocks. Yeah, there's no range there. Now your blocks can decrease in percentages i suppose but you have six chunks you fill it up very linearly and then i think it takes too many clicks too many button presses yes to actually make the herbs and heal yourself you've got to combine at least twice and then move it into the pill dispenser then exit the menu then use the pill dispenser and you have to push the button however many blocks you want to heal at that time so it takes five plus presses to heal one square of health and it's yes. just so cumbersome and in the heat of battle especially it's like the signing your death warrant yeah it's uh <laughs> yeah it's just, it's just it's far more difficult than it needs to to be and i get that the idea is like you're dispensing the individual pills in your hand now one two three four five six eat them all or whatever the heck you're doing it's like a pez dispenser it's it it was kind of like that um again just very similar to the item management the item management and the health system go hand in hand with me in this game of just like yeah unneeded changes i'm not sure why they made and uh glad none of this stuck around in in the future (laughs) i i guess i should say do you want to talk about some positive aspects of the game before we continue our bash fest here? Because I assume that's I, what this is largely going to be, <laughs> no matter where we go next, whether it be... I do. I do okay. want to talk some positives. I I know one positive that stands out to me. And this The was, dedicated melee button? That's part of it, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, Yes, having a dedicated melee button is good. I wish the hit detection was a little bit better on it, because the prompt would show up when they were on the ground. And sometimes you'd swing the air instead of yeah, yeah. stomping on them. But the actually, the like melee combat is actually fairly satisfying. It, I think it is a progression from Resident Evil 5's punching things. Mm-hmm. Especially, strangely, really in the Jake campaign, Jake and Sherry. I Jake just has because fit- I played Jake and you. Yeah, played you Sherry. just. I'm. I not as much with Sherry. <laughs> she's she's got a little. Well, she had the baton. lightning stick there, but yeah, but Jake has like a charging palm strike and, and he's punching. he's learned he's learned the basics of CQC from the boss in Metal Gear <laughs> Solid Three. Yeah, it's strange. It his fists are actually a weapon in your your weapon line. It's not a wheel, but your weapon line is fists you can choose them and then yeah which is so fascinating from a character gameplay especially he was the third campaign that we played i like the the melee combat overall in this game it's satisfying the dedicated roundhouse kick button as you you would joke about before we played 
I think the mechanics are all largely pretty good. The melee stuff is fun. I think the other thing with the melee stuff that I like is, I mean, you were kind of mentioning it with Jake, but even beyond Jake, like all the characters have their own kind of different flair when it comes to the melee moves they can pull off. You know, Mm -hmm. Chris is more of brute force and he'll do a lot of uppercuts or he'll pick up a enemy and chuck them across the room directly onto their head. Um, And that's really fun. I know Helena, uh, when we first started playing, I was doing some like, Spin a root, spinning around people and f- throwing them onto the ground, and you're like, "What the heck is she doing?" Like, she's doing some like luchador moves. Leon kind of has some wrestling moves in his repertoire as well, and so all of the different characters that are in this game across the various campaigns have some fun melee moves that I mm-hmm. think even from from the earliest stages of the game to uh, our final minutes with it, I still thought that that was always fun to. Know uppercut a zombie in the fa- in the face and watch him go flying. That was always yeah. that that was always very tactile and it felt it felt good to pull off those uh, those moments. Um, and not only that, but some of the boss bosses as well. I think of like the Simmons fight. Like you can just tackle the guy and just wail on him, which is very funny. Um, so hand to hand stuff. I think this is definitely the best in the series on that front like it's 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 it's, it's, that's one of the that's one of the better elements of this game mechanically as well uh like the first level the thing i talked about up front uh you were loving all the you know flipping around and rolling around you get to do and flying flying backwards and and that stuff's all really fun i guess and you can talk more to that but i guess my question for you though is like once you learned that stuff was there how much did you actually use it because that's the thing I would use it when I could. Yeah, I'd slide. Yeah. And so the game has this mechanic where you can just dive, slide, yes, s- sidle on the ground like a shuffle on your back. Like you can you can shoot from any position, and it reminds me a lot of both Metal Gear Solid Five and Max Payne Three. Now, Max Payne Three Bullet Time completely just slow-mo dynamic you can dive move shoot any way you want in that game and it's great and then in middle gear solid five you can you can dive roll slide hide in a box all this dynamic fluid movement through the world in this game it it, it's like i and i know both of those are third person shooters to a degree but this adhere so tightly to the like Resident Evil style of a third person shooter. Yes. And I love it for that. And you're so when you slide you can run and then slide on the ground and you're shooting as you're sliding. But then you'll stop moving and you can keep shooting or you could roll out of the way of an attack and then shoot from the ground and get back up and do a roundhouse kick. You could uh quickly tap the shoot button and he'll just pop you know, your character will pop the closest enemy to them. Yes, that's always really fun. There's a fluidity to it that feels so satisfying. And when you told me that I could do that, it was in the beginning of that Leon campaign, and I was just running and sliding and diving and jump. You can jump backwards, which feels great. It's just a a satisfying mechanic that I honestly wish, like the remakes of these third person, <laughs> you know, the of two, three, and now four, kind of had to a degree i especially three i think i think it would fit in four but i feel like if jill was like diving and sliding that would almost lend itself to that action over the top nature even more Uh, i really really enjoyed that mechanic it feels so good that's the strangest dichotomy of this game to me is that like i think a lot of games when they are bad it's because they are bad mechanically first and then you know it's everything else kind of after this game mechanically i would say is quite good in a, in a lot of ways up front like it is the first again the first couple levels we were having some fun we were diving around all over the place doing pulling off crazy moves and it's just those mechanics are undermined by just about everything else in this game <laughs> just what's it what's so bewildering like it it plays like a very fun it's a the mechanics are engaging too like you can you can do as much or as little with it as you want that's kind of why i asked like how much did you keep using some of these abilities and stuff like that because if you just want to play it you know like 
the same way how four and five play, for instance, like you can do that in this game, like the, but the mechanics are there for you to have more fluidity and more flair to what you're doing. And, uh, mm -hmm. in that, in that regard, I, I yeah, mechanically, I, they really knocked it out of the park with some of the upgrades compared to the others, because that, that was the big complaint about, um, five and five, you cannot move while shooting. Can shooting. you? Yes. No. Or you can in. I think in five you still can't, if I remember correctly. I think you definitely can correct. four, but I'm pretty sure you can five as well. If I'm wrong right. about that, I'm sorry. Either way, just this game from a from it's totally five to six is like totally sure. different. Yes, like they are giving you people. People are like, oh, I hate that I can't move while I shoot. They're like, well, how about we give you the ability not only to move but to do flips and rolls and yeah. run on the ground and slide. Yeah. Like they give you the ability to do. You can do uh, far more than just either. walking while shooting. Like you can do a lot, um, but yeah, that's that's the strangest thing is that despite all of that, the game is still not good, <laughs> uh, and, and then it's it's going to be everything else we're talking about here throughout the rest of this episode. I imagine. Um, I mean, we'll say there might be a couple other positive things to say, but I really do feel like everything else just undermines this game. Um, a couple things I want to touch on. I mean, one thing kind of broadly i feel like we can touch on because i feel like it's a shorter conversation to have before we start getting into some of the more uh difficult elements of this game to break down is like just the horror aspect of it um which has just been completely thrown out the window no it's scary at all no it's not there this is like it's... this is more like john wick than it is anything horror related <laughs> it is you know five wasn't really all that scary either no it wasn't it would try it sometimes but it would try to present horror though you know like it would still it would still try to create frightening moments or or, or, or try to I, I don't know like i think of some of those early stages in five where you're entering the village and stuff like that and it was trying to creep you out and trying trying to create a tense atmosphere and this game just really doesn't ever even try to do that very very much honestly right. It's it's a it's a B horror that's different than the previous kind of B horror that Resident Evil has thrived in to a degree. This is a uh, there's some like grotesque horror, body horror of you know bodies transforming into to bugs or hatching out of cocoons. But then there's also hatching that, out of hatching out of body cocoons. Yeah. After but catching on fire. <laughs> but then there's also that, like, they try to make some of these creatures, specifically Ada and Deborah, they just make flat out just, like, sexy horror, which is always a strange yes. juxtaposition to me within, like, a horror movie. Some of them work really well, right? You know, uh, what's that Megan Fox movie? Jennifer's Body. Like, that's a good. that would be a good example of using sexy horror in a way or it follows which is literally using sex and horror together in a, a creepy way mm -hmm. but this is just a we're gonna flash naked women in front of you and it's gonna be scary it just feels really weird and wildly out of date it does feel very much of the time right that gamers play on X xbox with your bros kind of era and this is the co-op game with your bros and you you know you're gonna have fun so but it's weird. It just doesn't feel right. Every it, even they, they even try to make Sherry sexy to a degree. Yeah, like they the give her clothes. some jiggle. They give her some jiggle physics, and then and, they make sure you see them by putting them in your face in a cutscene. Exactly, and it's and Sherry is the little girl from Resident Evil Two that you you theoretically have saved yourself. So like, there's this weird dichotomy there it's just like she was a little girl just the five games ago and now she's an adult i get time if you actually had played two and then played six when it came out your view on this has changed after you've been a father you're like i don't want to think about yeah it's really weird it's just <laughs> off-putting and you and clearly it's not necessary because it's not in seven or eight or really in the yeah. remake Even i was gonna say that's the that's the other thing is like there there's really not those elements in any of the other games t too much, you know? No, like, there's, I, like, there's a late, little late bit in 4 they, with Ashley. Well, they try to present... There is some in 4 with Ashley, yeah. And they, they always try to present Ada as, like, a sexy character, but they don't do it at the cost of, like, her, like, 
it's more like her uh beha- her mannerisms are kind of right. considered and like sexy or whatever. This is Ada previously was always just like you know, she'd have like the slit on the dress but then there's the gun holster there. This yeah. is just I'm Ada, here's my deep V shirt and sweater with a scarf and I'm here's me hatching out of a body cocoon. Like Ada, it's different this time around. It's it undermines her. I mean, I guess if you are gonna hatch, you're not gonna hatch with clothes on. So come on, you gotta give them some. I guess if you want to be a realistic <laughs> bug hatcher, I suppose it's it's an undermining way to present it instead of a from a position of power and or, or you know the character's own choice. And it's it's weird. It just doesn't feel good. And it's it's something that. I feel like they would address when and if they remake this game someday, right? Please no. No, Please I'm saying this. Well, like, assuming they continue on this trajectory, this is arguably the game out of all of them, except the old ones that needed a rework from a mechanical and presentation perspective. This is a fundamental would need to be significantly changed. It would almost it wouldn't um... even be the same game. I think narratively to some degree level length like all the stuff that we're going to talk about all that has oh, yeah, to be yeah. tightened way 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 up and changed uh, and so this and i think that would be part of the things that they could address yeah <laughs> there's not much else to say about that stuff it's it's there but whatever um we're talking about some of the characters i don't know if you just want to get into a full thing with the characters now or if there's anything else like broadly about the game you would like because i know we've been more from like, a from a gameplay and perspective design there's at least one more thing i want to talk about game yeah wise. i feel like we should just talk about all the gameplay stuff now while we're doing it and then we'll jump into story and characters um what did you want to talk about i think it might be the most frustrating part of the game at least that we experienced especially by the end the constant uh, kill an enemy and then the enemy comes back. You kill him again and then they come back and then they come back and then they come back. And I'm not talking about, you know, a boss that keeps reappearing, although that is annoying from a repetition perspective, but I'm talking just about normal enemies where you shoot them and then they transform and then you kill them again and then they transform again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's just constant. They never die. You shot my arm off. Now I'll grow a shield or whatever. Oh, now you shot my head off. Well, now I'm going to turn into a brick of, of mm-hmm. a cocoon thing and something's going to bust out of me. It's like, oh my gosh. Like, yeah, there are. So like the evolutions have always been in the Resident Evil games. And I mean, I'm playing for remake right now. And that's, they, they even introduced new ones in that game, like with their heads tilted to the side and stuff like that, which is intense. I don't like that so far. Anyway, <laughs> um, so this has like always been a thing within the series, but in this game they really go overboard with it where like enemies can mutate like multiple times in different ways. Like we were I shot his arm off. Oh, he grew a, a claw. I shot his other arm off. He grew another claw. I, I shot his head off. Well, now he's m- mutating again and it's just like yes. I, I there are a lot of mutations and evolutions and I guess in that sense uh, talking about the enemy variety as well, there is a fair amount of enemy variety, which I would commend the game for. There are two main types of enemies, zombies and uh, Havo, Wavo? Jawavo. I think it's Spanish. I don't know why no, it's they Spanish. said they, they said the J, because I said this while we were playing. I'm like, Ugh. oh, you pronounce it with the J. Okay. It's Jawavo, apparently. Well, there's two main types, yes, and they're... There's really not a lot of zombies. I think zombies are mostly in the Leon campaign, but really it's it's mostly the Javo, which is... Well, whenever you get into... Uh, yeah, in the Leon campaign, there's definitely a lot there in the opening area of uh, Washington that you're in. Washington um, and the graveyard when you get to the next spot. So it's a lot of zombies in Leon's, which is interesting. But the rest of them mostly fight these bug people. Yes. Too many is, bugs. C virus, the Joavo are obviously from five as well, I believe. Um, Stem that from that, the, sure. Yeah, they come from they come from five, so uh, it's all similar stuff that we've been seeing. It, honestly, that's what this game feels like. It's it's they had the idea of like, oh, we've been doing this stuff with you know the the Las Plagas, the Joavo, and then uh, further back in the series, we've just got normal zombies. What if we threw both at them? And so at that on that front, it's like okay. 
I understand what you're going for here. I understand what you're doing with this game, um, but it's just not. I don't know. There is a there is a good variety of enemies. I'll I will say, but it's never. But th- this is just the problem with the game as a whole. I'm talking more about the design stuff. It's just too long. Like this game is too long. The four campaigns. Um, and maybe we can use this as a segue to talk about the story and characters and stuff here. Sure. But just this game's structure is its biggest flaw. Not only did there not need to be, I'll say this. I don't, I don't even think the four campaign idea on its own is a bad one, to be honest. The problem is that the four campaigns recycle set pieces, bosses, like there were how many of these moments in the, which I get the point is they want to show you the different perspectives of the characters when they cross over at various times in the campaign. That's fine. But how about we not outright replay these sections where we're doing the same things? Like when we got to the final campaign with Ada, I was like, oh, here we go with Deborah. I think we're going to have to ride a mine cart here again. And I think we're going to have to go down this big old tunnel again. And it's like we've already done these things. And so they're it's very strange to make for them to literally make you replay the save sections of the game. Uh, it's a it's a poor reuse of assets and just bloats the game time, total game time. There are games that do this of course, like multiple protagonists replays. Yeah. It's actually a staple of the Resident Evil series is multiple playthroughs from different characters' perspectives all the way back to Resident Evil 1 with the Jill and Cress. And that's cool, but I think where they falter is when the characters do intersect, when their stories do, it's too often and not enough different things are happening. I think primarily of like Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, where there are maybe three key moments where everyone is interacting at one particular point. The rest of the time you are going through the worlds and other characters' actions may or may not impact the world, but you rarely are, are crossing paths with Terra, Aqua, and Ven. This game, it's, oh, I'm Chris and Nevins, and then, oh my gosh, here's Sherry and Jake. Here's Nevins, actually, not Nevins. Nevins, Pierce. Nevins? I don't know. Clearly, you know me. I can't pronounce anyone's name in this Pierce game. Here's Nevins. Piers. But what, what, are, what are the things that are happening when they meet up in China? Oh, they're both shooting the bug people and the helicopter. Like, there's no gameplay differentiation there. The thing that the one that stands out to me the most is being, uh, I mean, not the most egregious, but one of the ones that I was just like, really? Like, there's no, how is there no difference of what is happening in this situation? Is the one where uh, Chris's campaign crosses over with Jake's campaign, and there's the helicopter overhead, and we had played Chris's campaign before, and in that part, your role is to shoot down the various Juavo off the helicopter and stuff like that while uh, Sherry and Jake are down below and they're trying to protect themselves or whatever. But when you go to Jake's campaign, what is your objective? It's to shoot the Juavo off the helicopter. And it's like, well, shouldn't that be Chris's objective since we already did that? Like, why are we doing the same objective that we did in the Chris campaign when Chris and Piers are the ones, you know what I'm saying? Like, there should be like variations of objectives amongst characters even if you're going to see the same set piece recycled instead they recycle the objectives and the goals and stuff like that and that's what makes it very frustrating to uh, play all four of the campaigns like when leon and chris's campaign cross over there at the warehouse and the door that stops you what are you doing you're both shooting the little robot vacuum bombs yes like there's nothing different about getting to the intersection point it's the same rehashing the same thing and so as you know presumably capcom wants you to play all four campaigns in a row like together to get the full experience of the game now you're just repeating the same thing over the course of 20 hours and so it makes that 20 hour experience feel like 40 hours yes it's just dragging its feet through yeah this is a 20 hour game that felt far longer than it is. Um, and there were some missions where we were just really beating our head. Like Leon's campaign, the only saving grace, I think, or one of the few saving graces of this game for you and I is that after we beat Leon and Chris's campaign, I was like, well, the good news is the other two are shorter. Like Leon's yeah. campaign really goes on far too long. I think it was about a seven hour campaign. It was pretty. It was pretty lengthy. Um, and then Chris's, I think, was like five, six, and then Jake and Sherry was like three, four, and then Ada was like two, three. Yeah. So 
Leon's is particularly lengthy and that whole section with the crypt and Deborah and that whole sequence, like that level, it just feels endless and it like it just keeps going on and on and on. I think there's something to be said about you just being having tighter sections and not dragging players around, you know, and um, far too much in this game that is just bloat that could have been cut out completely Mm -hmm. Uh, not only narratively but gameplay wise too because it's just not fun (laughs) like there are sections of this game where we were just really uh trying to get through it um needed more needed more variety across all four of the campaigns to be certain so this kind of brings me to my next point though I, i told you i want to jump off yeah talking about the campaigns and how the game's structured and and this is something i um this is something I told you before we record. I was like, remind me to bring this up when we record. And obviously I wasn't going to forget because it is such a core element of the game. Um, we're in a point right now with the series with village having just ended. And we're trying to think about, you know, what are they going to do next? What would they do in nine? And I, I remember a few years ago, um, saying like, oh, I hope it's, you know, I hope they bring back a lot of characters. I hope we see Jill and Leon and Claire, like bring back a lot of characters. Let's throw in a lot of characters in Resident Evil 9 because we haven't seen so many of these people in such a long time. And playing this game, this was the ensemble game. Like this, uh, every Resident Evil game focuses on one or two characters kind of max and then you don't really know what's going on with the others. And uh I think that's always worked well for the series, but people have always wanted to see, you know, what if we had a game where Jill and Chris and Leon and Claire and everybody was all together. And it's like, well, this is kind of the one where they're like, sure. Okay. Well, we're going to do something like that. And it does not work. (laughs) And I think there are a lot of, uh, maybe it could work in another sense. And maybe that's something we can talk about, uh, later or on another episode. Hint, hint, potentially if we do that, um, but it just it, it's 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 very fascinating to go to this game and see it as an ensemble, see it as the Resident Evil game where they finally try to throw not all, but a lot of them a lot of the main cast of characters together into a single title for the first time, and it just falters completely as a result. And I think a lot of that is because the characters are still too segregated from one another. You know, the campaigns are largely independent from each other, which is fine to some degree but then it's undermined by kind of what we were talking about before like when they do cross over those are arguably like the worst sections of the game (laughs) when those crossovers happen there's never a moment where they all unite together right in a big ensemble game a big party setting you want everyone to come together and be united and that never really happens in this game. I think the closest, and not in a united sense, but the closest we get probably is is when Chris and Leon meet at the warehouse and they have this like 10 second fist fight before they realize who each other is. Which is funny because on the box you just see the two of them like pointing guns at each other. So it indicates some sort of conflict and really there's no conflict between the two of them at all. And I think it's... <sighs> They never are together, you know, in this sense of we are going to stop this thing, you know, this evil. The only time it, the only team. time it re- the only time it really happens is kind of the climax of the various campaigns where Chris is like, oh, we're going to get Jake Muller, who we found is in this underwater thing. Leon, you handle what's happening on land where they just launched a missile. Yeah, but they're still separate, right? In the sense of really Leon's Leon and Ada's campaign probably are the ones that intermingle the most. And then Chris and Jake's intermingle the most. But the yeah. the overarching, you know, what is the seven of them never, you know, we don't get a shot of them all lined up and ready to, to take down the big bad. Well, that's together. the thing. There isn't, I mean, there is a big bad, but there's also not. And there's like different it's ones. Ada. To, <laughs> it's, a, it's Ada. It's Ada. It's Ada, but not Ada. It's uh, what's her? What was her real name? Clara. Something like that. It starts I with think a C. I know. Clara or Carla. And then there's Simmons. Carla is what it is, I think. Okay. Um, and then there's Simmons, and then there's in Chris's campaign, there's ends up being the giant monster there at the end. Which sure, that's fine. And then 
I'm trying to think of what's in Jake's. Oh, Jake's Uncle is Unk. Uncle Uncle Unk is what we call them, which is the best Uba, one. Uba stank, it's, Uba it's, uh, it's a stank. A stank. A stank. Uba stank. Uba stank. Uba stank's a band, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, Hoover Stank is chasing you down this whole game. <laughs> no, and he's Uncle the best Unk. one because he, Uncle Unk is just like Nemesis Light. Um, uh, I wrote fun. Nemesis with a comb over. Yeah, pretty much. So everybody has their own bosses, which works out to some degree. But again, it, it, it prevents that sense of, you know, cohesion to some degree. And there are moments like uh, Jake crossing over with Leon and all of them fighting Uncle Unk. I'm sorry, we're going to call him Uncle Unk. I know that's not his name, but. So we yeah, the whole I made game. it. I made it stick in that when we played it there at the end. I was like, "We gotta take out Uncle Unc," and you just you were like, "Who? I'm like <laughs> that guy?" <laughs> I know it's um, something like that. Yeah, there's 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 too many villains. There's not enough focus, and I guess this is the large. I mean, we could talk about the. It's probably best to talk about the story too. Like we this need is to. The, it's this is the worst story in any of the games. Like by there's a mile. So much aimless narrative padding for i don't know two and a half chapters at least helena's like we gotta make it to the crypt and the church and then i'll tell you what's happening we gotta make it to the basement and then i'll tell you what's happening deborah and then i'll tell you what's happening oh and then you're like who's deborah like like that's the weird thing about the leon campaign is she shows up she's like oh no deborah and you're like and did i miss something like what is going on here yep Chris dealing with PTSD and being a drunk and but but then Piers Piers Nevins shows up with his old (laughs) compatriots and they're all in a bar and they're like commander please lead us again and then you do a flashback with Chris and find out Finn McCauley died (laughs) and uh, then Jake you have as the mercenary who's gonna sell his blood for is it 500 million or 50 million or 50,000 or $50? The price changes so much. Honestly, Jake and Sherry's probably makes the most sense. It does off of the back. And this is the thing I mentioned, I think, in our last episode is in a lot of ways, five tied up all of the threads that had been in Resident Evil from the beginning. And even a lot that were introduced, you know, there with four. And it felt like a good, like everything that had transpired from the Raccoon City games into Code Veronica into 4 really tied off there with Wesker dying. And then you get into this game and it's like, well, what are they going to do next? It's the next mainline Resident Evil. How do they continue the saga? And it's like, uh, Neo Umbrella and Simmons chief advisor Derek Simmons and it's like what who is who is Derek Simmons like what is like that guy he's the worst villain in all of these Resident Evil games by a mile like I I don't I I do not think that's even close they and they don't contextualize like who any of these people are like everyone in the game knows who everyone is but we the player don't yes I actually had to look up the like the motivation for Simmons and Carla, aka Ada. Yeah, 2. they don't 0. even do anything. Like you just get to the Ada campaign, and she's like, "Oh, Carla, blah 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 blah." I'm like, "Who the heck is Carla? Who's Carla? What are we? What and are we so, talking about here?" And when you look it up, which actually I I assume because clearly people got this from somewhere if they're fleshing out Wikipedia pages. I assume it's from in-game collectibles, which you get by shooting the medallions. And then have to go into this really slow menu to then read. But the 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 gist of the villainous plot to bring down the entire world, infect it all, is this young female student wins like awards and is very smart and she tries to impress this Simmons character because she's infatuated with him and, and wants to be smart. And but he's Simmons like a scientist uses- dude, right? Simmons, yeah, and is, but becomes the chief security advisor to the president of the United States. And <laughs> Simmons just ignores her because he's crushing on Ada. And Ada, how does he th- even know Ada? That's the Who thing. Knows? She's like a black market mercenary for hire. And like- so this desire for Simmons' attention and this obsession with Ada drives both of these characters to become supervillains, essentially, and, and, and infect the world. So much to the point that Carla transforms herself into a clone of Ada 
and then Simmons is like, ah, my Ada. It's so And then somehow weird Helena and, creepy. and her sister get involved with all of this too, yeah, which is it, never really made clear either. She's just like, Deborah's my sister, and we were kidnapped or I don't know. It's and like the whole, yeah, we, And so this drives them to infect the entire world with a deadly virus. At least Wesker's plot in five, his motivation was we evolution we will weed out the weak and the next step in human you know evolution at least he had it and he thinks he's the top of the food chain so he thinks he's right. gonna like there's at least rule a clear over all of motivation this, this is yes. just and that's all context that and i got <laughs> after playing the game and looking yeah. it up online this is we didn't know this during the game at all yeah yep so it's like so I, it's, bad it's one of the worst stories ever. And, and it's not a thing with, I was going to point to some of the previous games in the series. Like it's not one of those instances where it's like, Oh, I like, I might, I'm, I don't like new characters or I don't like when they introduce new villains in the series. Like they don't have to have huge extensive backstories, but they have to be properly contextualized within the game. Like code Veronica does that really well with the Ashford twins. I would say, uh, what's the mercenary guy's name in three, uh, Nikolai, they do that well oh. with Nikolai in three. Like he's there for just a bit, but it's like this guy's a scummy mercenary or he's just willing to sell to the highest bidder. Like, yeah. like you, you understand, like I don't understand anything about Carla and Derek Simmons. Like Simmons. who are these people? Where did they come from? It's just, I don't like know. The, the like the plot it, twist, they react as if the plot twist of Simmons being behind it all is so huge. And like chapter two of Leon's campaign where they find out the national security advisor pulled off the attack and is framing Leon. And we're just like, who? What? Like, there's no weight to any of this. And it's it's honestly super confusing. It doesn't help that Leon's campaign literally starts with him shooting the president of the United States of America in the head. I love that because it's so funny because Leon hesitates. He's like, don't make me do it, sir. I can't do it. And then later on in the campaign, when Helena has to kill someone, I think kill a zombie or something that she knew. Leon's like, don't hesitate, Helena. <laughs> and here he was at the beginning of the game, hesitating to shoot the president. Yeah, it's it's real bad. It's real bad. I, I'm, it's rough. It's a good thing they rebooted things afterwards. Um, wipe the slate clean. Bring, the, us, the que- bring us the girl, wipe away the debt. <laughs> the question after five was very much, where do they go from here? And the answer is... We don't know because clearly <laughs> they did not know and they just made some sort of crappy narrative for the purpose of a co-op action third person shooter. Um, yeah. And it sold well. Did it? Yeah. I didn't look up the sales. Yep. This game, I believe, was the fastest selling in the franchise. <laughs> so really? uh, sales. Here we go. They expected it to sell seven million copies by the end of the 2012 fiscal year. Uh, they lowered it to six. Capcom announced it. It shipped 4.5 worldwide in October. It sold. Just... I mean, it got it got off to a hot start. I should say. I don't know I what should... the tail was that it had on it, but I think sure. I think within the past month or two, when Four Remake came out, it was announced like, "Oh, RE Four Remake is the new fastest selling ever." It passed Resident Evil Six. And I was like, "Oh my gosh, what?" Here's the. Uh... The pertinent sentence. Resident Evil 6 became Capcom's fourth best-selling game by December of 2020 with a lifetime sales of 7.7 million. Um, That's only three, not even three full years ago. So Uh Resident Evil 6 has had a pretty good leg of sales if it's their fourth best-selling game of all time just as of three years ago. Um, and, you know, 2.3 million of that is the PS4 and Xbox One versions of the game. So people keep buying it? I, I, <laughs> I mean, we're guilty of it, I guess. I, I mean, to be fair, I bought a second, you know, a used copy. So I didn't True. bump that metric. Someone else did that. Is there, uh, while we're talking about the story here, is there anything you want to say? We've talked a lot about the villains. Is there anything you want to say more about like the protagonists though and their own arcs in this game? Because I still feel like there's a lot to say about that and maybe we can go one by one with the campaigns. Um, I want to start with Chris though because I think he actually has the best one where it's just he's 
a, an alcoholic now and he's just uh, drinking away in a bar and he's like oh i let my men die oh my gosh and he has he has the funniest arc in this the game funniest for, he, i'll say that he, he doesn't he, have the best he, he at least well he at least has an arc like i don't even know what leon's arc is it's just like i'm leon kennedy i gotta fight the zombies and leon's is i love ada um yeah kind of chris's campaign is they try to be edgy with it i'm a drunk now i lost my soldiers i've got ptsd amnesia i don't even remember peers yeah yeah i totally i totally forgot finn mccauley died in edonia or wherever they're at the, yeah but then all of a sudden it, it kind of snaps and, and that gets washed away and, and there's even a part though where he's like punching the wall and banging things he's like no i can't lose my man again. i don't know they just tried to be serious about it and i think it gets over the top and corny really really quick but that's kind of like the nice part about it is because it's at Evil least fun is to corny. laugh at yes and then you've got piers nivens the whole time trying to talk him talk him up like come on you're our commander blah blah blah, blah. and chris will like lash out at him at various times i still think of one moment in the campaign where he's like i'm going after ada wong you can come with me if you want to stay out of my way <laughs> it's just and then by the end of the game he's like you're gonna be the next leader of our battalion <laughs> And then you're and the next here's... generation. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all very silly. Chris's campaign, I think, is fun within that. It's at least very straightforward. Like, I could wrap my mind around Chris's campaign in the way that I couldn't. Like, Leon's is just nuts. Again, starts off, shoots the president in the face. Cool. Then we got Derek Simmons, and we got Debra's, and we got Helena. Who's Helena? I don't know. She won't tell us anything. And then uh, just Leon's is everywhere and then we've also got the him i think leon's the one who says it multiple times i think chris does too but there's a couple line deliveries in this game of it's raccoon city all over again like <laughs> i liked ada's it's a uh, raccoon city reunion <laughs> yeah there's a couple different Except line de- deliveries for claire like that. and jill aka two-fifths of the group <laughs> yeah yeah, Jill's just the character that Time forgot, apparently, or that Capcom God, forgot. They just hate on Jill. So they're like, you gotta we'll play Revelations. On, we'll put her on I will the 3DS. Say, I will say, I haven't told you this. This is, uh, But our friend of the show, Ricky Freck, actually played Revelations for the first time, and he said, this is maybe one of my five favorite, favorite Resident Evil games. You need to play this. So, Oh my goodness. I think you and I, I mean, should play that them. one. We do he said them. He said Jill's in that, and she's real good in it. Good, good. At least they give Jill something. I, they need to bring Jill back. Jill for Resident Evil Nine. Or they do. Riot. Outside, of, I, the one campaign I did want to touch on more individually, though, and the one that's actually there to talk about more is Troy Baker's campaign, aka Jake's <laughs> campaign, because uh, he is the new character oh. to this game, and we have to also talk about how the final stinger of this game almost sets him <laughs> up to be like the new protagonist of the series like really quick hey. you saying troy baker reminded me first of all sonic the hedgehog reprises his role as chris but we started with leon's campaign and immediately i'm like i know leon's voice and that turned out to be uh the critical role man ganondorf and matt mercer the kingdom. matt yeah. mercer and I'm like, this Helena sounds a bit familiar too. And it's Laura <laughs> Bailey. And then you've got Troy Baker is Jake. I'm like, this game's just missing Nolan North and um, Nathan Fillion. And then we're all set. So very much like that peak time for them all to just be in everything. And I yes. couldn't help but think of the fact that at the time of making this game, Troy Baker's not only doing Jake M- Muller in Resident Evil 6, he's also playing Booker DeWitt in bioshock infinite and he's joel in (laughs) the last of us i'm like what a range of performances and like stories and narratives it's clearly that jake is definitely the one that he phoned in the most i would have to imagine because i I don't want to say sounded in but he just sounds like troy baker it it just sounds like him yeah yeah it just sounds like him with a little bit of a a little bit of gruff in his voice and that's not a knock against Troy. It's just Troy has a distinctive voice and he's in a lot of games. And Well, I, Joel, I, like you could not, you could hear Troy's normal voice and then hear Joel and you'd be, you'd be like, that's the same person. Like, yeah, Jake, the, Jake and Troy, though, it's just like, oh, yeah, 
So mm-hmm. that's him. Yep. yep. We immediately, I was just, it was very funny to, to kind of have almost the entire gang together in one game. Speaks to the production value. They, you know, these are big name actors and still are, and they represent it there. But yes, Jake's campaign and being set up as the seven protagonists, essentially, at the end of it. A deal's a deal, kid. Fair's Chomp. fair, I think is what <laughs> oh, he fair's says. Fair's fair, that's what he says. Fair's fair, and then he eats an apple. It doesn't even make sense. The secret <laughs> that, son of that, Wesker. That whole scene doesn't make any sense. Why are there like 25 hunters outside of this little boy's house? I don't. <laughs> and why does he trade Jake an apple to kill them all? I don't know, uh, man. <laughs> it's so strange. It's... What did you think about Jake, though? And like the, I mean, because when we started this game, I was like, oh, and that campaign is about Wesker's son. You're like, what? Like, I think, I, I, I will say, I think the idea of Wesker having a bastard child that no one knows about that still exists after his death, because Wesker is one of the main characters of the series, and he is important. So just going from five to six, and your Capcom's trying to think like, well, what, what are some of the things you could do? I think the idea of Wesker having offspring is fine, and it's a good one, actually. I, I, I think Jake, in theory, is a pretty good idea it's more the execution that i don't really like i don't know they don't really prove to they don't do much with it it's just it's just a way to it's just a way to resolve what happens in the game like oh now we got jake's blood and up everybody's healed then yay crisis averted at the end of the game like that's about all it really becomes is he's just kind of a MacGuffin more than anything that everybody's chasing after including uncle unk including uncle unk i my issue with wesker being his father more stems from jake's reaction to this news first of all he doesn't really seem to know like who wesker is like he just learns about who this is later on and you know through the game he's like yeah, i think he just tried tried to destroy the world i don't know but I read some Jake, early Jake documentation that kind of explained his origins in the game. And he was basically grew up with a a mother who was sick and his father was never in the picture. And so he doesn't know that Wesker's his father and he despises this absent father in his life. Goes on to become a mercenary and, and do all that sort of stuff. And then he finds out that Wesker's his father and suddenly starts acting like he, he loved his father or loves the idea of his father, which I guess to a degree as a, you know, an orphan essentially because his mother does end up dying. This idea of your father is crazy. And then he, he learns that Chris, one of the guys he keeps bumping into is the killer of his father's. Like, no, you better put a leash on that puppy. And then just like threatens to kill Chris. And it just feels very phoned in. There's no depth to why Jake would even care that Wesker was his father. It's like, well, screw him. He was never around in the first place. I don't care. Either way, now you do want my blood because of the genetic information Wesker left behind, but who, I don't know. It feels. I guess you would still feel it. I, I guess you would still, I mean, he, the idea is that he still feels a sting because, I mean, Chris is the one who killed his dad. So, and his dad but, is his dad. But his he dad grew up with was daddy. dead to him his entire life up until this event. Yeah, but that's I mean, my I don't problem. Know. It's like within the, the span of 24 hours, he goes from. I hate my father. He left us. He didn't help my mother. Forget him to you killed my father. How dare you? Like, it's just, it's too big a swing. I still think there's a part of, I mean, I have, I did not grow up fatherless or anything like that, but I still think there's even for people who are like that, you know, like my, my parents abandoned me. I, I resent them for that. I think there is still part of them that is hoping to like, meet them and have closure with them or or something or i i don't know i i would guess there's like a a, a wanting mm. uh or desire to interact with them to some degree um so to find out that chris is the one who robbed him of that i i i, I think it makes sense the more i think about it but i do agree it is a he is kind of all over the place it's a heck of a and it's not within 24 hours excuse me this game takes place over a span of six months they go to jail in China for six months. Okay, but the news the news of his father is essentially a short period of time. Yeah. 
Sorry, didn't mean to. Did you like Sh- did you like Sherry's reintroduction though, or I think I think bringing her back in the fold is actually a smart idea. I, I like Jake too. I should say, and I've said this in previous episodes this season is. A core element of Resident Evil to me is introducing new characters. Like, that has always been a pillar of this series. Um, So to do so, whether that be, you know, with Sheva in 5, and in this game they decide to do it with Jake, but they don't make him, uh, they don't put him alone, obviously, so they bring back a character that is not new but hasn't been around in some way in some time with Sherry. And I I I think that's a good dynamic, putting him with somebody that fans... No, but somebody that's not, you know, a Jill or something like I that. I do I do think that Sherry is a better partner than a Claire or a Jill. I, I think mm-hmm. her reintroduction fits, it makes sense in this in this world and in this particular story. It's cool to see her become a BSAA agent for or not no, she's just a an American government spy agent, whatever. She works it's for cool. Derek Simmons. She works for Derek Simmons. It's cool to see her trying to almost right the wrongs of her parents from raccoon yeah. city. I do find it a little strange that like they brush over it in the game a little bit, but she has superpowers to like heal her body. Yeah. They don't really do anything with that after they introduce it. She's yeah, just like, Oh my dad like experimented on experimented, me or something. Yeah. So that was a little strange, but it's cool to see her try to, to write those wrongs and bring Jake into the light. So to speak, it's cool. Definitely the best, I think, pair out of everyone. I think Piers is entirely forgettable. And well, I think so Piers is, is just, yeah, Piers is, Helena, I think, is the worst. I, I like Piers just because he's like, Captain, Captain Redfield. And I just like that he's one of Chris's boys. I just, sure. That's funny to me. And, and that kind of leads into even Village, where Chris is just still a captain of a force. Like, Nivens is just one of his boys in that sense that he sure, yeah. resides over. And I, I like that sort of... Uh, I like Chris be, <laughs> just having his own little militia that he travels around the globe with and just appears as one of those guys. Helene is horrible. Um, I do think, too... I mean, we're talking about the individual campaigns here. Jake's is the best, though, like, for sure, because there's a mm-hmm. persistent threat from Mission 1 to Mission 5, with Uncle Unk, like yeah. there is some consistency there. Um, I think the set pieces are the best. I think that campaign is also the perfect length where it's like three and a half, four hours, something in there rather yeah. than being closer to six. Jake's is the tightest. I think it does the best stuff with the narrative because yeah. most of it's new and it makes sense from the go. Like here's Jake. Why is Jake important? Oh, it's his blood. Like, like Sherry is trying to track him down and get his blood and knows his value before there's ever like a big, like before China ever gets bombed or whatever later in the campaign, you know, like there is value. Um, and that's explained just by, by all accounts. I think Jake's campaign is the best one. Like absolutely for sure. It's definitely the one we had the most fun with. It has yeah the right amount of the over the top nature, especially toward the end there really good co-op moments it's a great even the set pieces too like they don't last too long i think of the motorcycle chase like that compared to like the chris driving sequence from his campaign like that driving sequence on the highway lasts way too long way too bloated the motorcycle though it's like the right length to be like enjoyable and it doesn't overstay its welcome i don't think i the only thing in jake's campaign that i didn't enjoy and i know you didn't enjoy it either was the dark snowy mountain oh yes a big open area with there is a map but it's useless and so that was that area is a bit too aimless a bit too difficult even we bumped the brightness up all the way which was only five more points and it doesn't really help at all so besides that jake's is definitely the best i think followed by chris's and then it's a toss-up between ada and leon's and ada's is more of a structural problem than a length problem, or, I mean, her narrative is is totally confusing. Well, we could so, talk about, I mean, I wanted to talk about Ada's here anyway, so we may as well. Um, let's do it. Ada's is meant to be solely single player, which doesn't make any sense. They then it fold was, in the co-op, and it's not good. It was originally released as a bonus campaign after beating all three, and it was purely single player at launch. And then... Not a week later, uh, 
I guess just over a week, October 10th, 2012, Capcom, right before Comic-Con, New York Comic-Con, clarified on-disc DLC versus online DLC. Remember when that was a big deal when games would have content on it? It was like, everything on the disc is free. We just have to unlock it with a patch or whatever. But this particular notice also said that Ada's campaign will have an update to add co-op, which it's so interesting that in this co-op game <laughs> that the bonus campaign at the end would originally not have co-op. But then yeah. when they add it, they add it in the lightest manner possible. So much so that the partner is just agent and the agent cannot interact with objects, cannot open doors. It's not in any of the cutscenes. Teleports when Ada zip lines around. It is purely a. I was there to provide to covering. Shoot. Yeah, I was there to provide covering fire, and that was it. And you had to do everything else. And I, I offered to switch halfway through so that we could both experience it, but you wanted to ride out being agent. I which wanted totally to be fine. agent, baby. It agent was to, so the, to agent to the end. Frustrating and weird. Yes, both as someone who was playing as Ada. And I can only imagine as someone playing as the agent, it's just so, it is a second class citizen co-op partner angle. If you really shouldn't, it, we really should have just played Ada's campaign solo, each of we us to get have. the proper experience, but gosh darn it, we're, we're united to the end. <laughs> it's one of the strangest co- implementations of co-op I've seen in a game that I can mm-hmm. remember. And again, oh, it yeah. was added post launch, but like, if you're not going to add like, just no like some very obvious elements to it like why can i not open a door why can i not and the do systems this? Like, were there right clearly because yeah. the other three campaigns support all of it so i'm just so i'm i'm baffled i'm baffled yeah. by this, this i don't mode. like to use this word often when it comes to like game development when that word is lazy but it really <laughs> did feel lazy like they were just d- throwing it in there just so that they could like check off a box and say like, oh, well now the full game's co-op done, but it's really, it's not like you had, you had to do everything as Ada. And I was just like, okay, I'll stand in a corner. And we kept joking that like agents involvement didn't even make sense. And it was like Ada's imaginary friend that was running Mm -hmm. around with her basically. Um, We imagined that Ada was actually losing her mind. Outside of that Ada's campaign, I did, want to say is definitely one of the worst um even outside of the co-op problems i would have to say um just rehash like outside the first level was completely unique to ada yes but then everything else was a rehash of other levels which is the exact thing we said we did not like about some of the other various uh missions i mean not everything to a t you know like she goes to the church and her, her second mission and you do some things that aren't tied necessarily to Leon and Helena, but then you're back through the same environments. You're doing the same things. You're fighting the same bosses. You're riding the same mine carts, and then you get to the next level, and it's like you're doing the same sorts of things there. So, like, you would just... All of her moments in the game were tied to... um, were tied to the other campaigns, which didn't make them make playing through it interesting whatsoever. Like, I thought her campaign was going to, like kind of tie all the other three together and shed light more on some big things and it kind of does um but not really at the same time and, yeah i had to look it up after we beat the game to truly understand who they were talking about what they were meaning it's weird because you feel like her campaign should be the biggest of them all not in terms of length but she is kind of the character at the center of this game more than she's definitely the linchpin she yes her and jake are the two characters that are kind of vital to everything that is happening in this game because you know simmons is evil because of ada but simmons is also wanting jake for his blood and it's st- like st- i don't know they- they're the two core characters and jake's involvement it works out well and ada's is not not so much so yeah it is poorly done and quite odd it's a big it's a big old bummer one thing I wanted to go back to quickly, um, I know we, I feel like we've touched on largely everything about this game, but one thing I know we did not touch on was the bosses. 
um, and I wanted to ask you about what you thought about some of them. Again, there are in the same way as <laughs> the same way we talked about like enemy variety and lots of mutations and evolutions in this game. I think the bosses do the same sorts of things. I think of Simmons and uh, Leon's campaign evolving into a T Rex and then evolving into a tiger or a panther or something like that and then evolving into a giant bug ant thing it's, towards the end there like there's a lot of very, different versions of these bosses you're finding the same enemy over and over again it's not dissimilar to wasn't this an element in five to a degree there was a character that kept am i mistaking that wasn't there a character in five that kind of kept coming back or toward the end was no i guess not i don't know it just feels are you thinking of the regenerators in four no this was more like a boss character that kept repeating itself kept coming back in some version one way or another i guess nemesis to a degree but nemesis is cool or um birkin yeah Again, I think Birkin actually is probably more similar in that way because it is pretty much the same fight. But Birkin's also the... not transforming into goofy yes. animals. <laughs> this is true. I, it's it's frustrating to... It's exhausting, really. Not frustrating. It's exhausting. It's like, ugh. We're fighting. Well, We've killed that... Simmons. We killed Simmons. It's over, right? It's not. And we That's actually the got to the point too, where we're like, we knew they weren't dead. We're like, they they will come back. Even Uncle Unc, melting in lava. We're like, nah, he's not dead. He'll be back. That's the, that was the weird thing about some of the cutscenes in this game too. Is like you'd do a boss fight and then the cutscene would play and it's like they deliver the kill shot. Like I think of the one with Simmons when you're on the train, and I think Helena or Leon, somebody, one of them shoots him directly in the head, like standing still right there. <laughs> they blast him in the head and he falls over and it's like oh we killed him there he goes and then that's like nope you got to fight him like three more times after this it's like okay well yeah. like what is up with these like weird cinematic kill shot moments like if you knew they were going to come back for you and keep chasing you kind of like like you did with uh nemesis in three like you knew he was never dead like you were just trying to get away more than anything um but some of the it's... bosses in this game they present them as if you've done away with them and it's like nope just kidding uh, I will say okay. the Simmons turning into a T-Rex was probably the coolest. <laughs> Maybe. Just, just visually, like, come on. You're fi- suddenly yeah. you're fighting a zombie dinosaur. Like, that is totally the b- most over-the-top, goofy that thing. That kind of, like, that it is. It is. I kind of, I, I, I'm, like, part way on it. Like, I like the over-the-top insanity of this series, and I've always said that, but that's almost jumping the shark for me. Like, that's almost, like, a jumping little the, too far. Jumping the T-Rex for Yes, you? yes. That, like, that's almost, like, a little too far. Like, we need to... Let's reel it back in just a I, tad bit. I think it fits but, in this particular game, given mm-hmm. everything else going on. Perhaps, yeah. It's but, certainly the goofiest, but... Yeah, it's a weird one. It's a weird weird game none of the boss fights in particular i like have left going man that was a blast except ustanak uncle unk he's good i do think that was good and again that's that's uncle all Jake's is campaign. Good, especially the very end of uncle unk the very end on the cart <laughs> where they they zip away <laughs> at like 300 miles an hour somehow don't fall off and then proceed to yeah how to does fight. he catch up with them don't question Uncle. Uncle. <laughs> the yeah, he was he was great. Came. There were moments where you'd like shut doors and then you'd walk into the next room and he all of a sudden busts through. Uh, he's rock ahead of wall you. He was behind of... you and now he's ahead of you. Uh, uh, yeah, what is he doing? <laughs> it's so uh, good. That shows that they could keep doing more things in the set that sort of nemesis style. I think in future games, um, which they obviously did with the three remake. But um, I, I think. We need, I think Resident Evil needs a persistent villain again. They do it a little bit in Village with Lady D, but it's only in that one level and mm-hmm. it's not as threatening or omnipresent. I think there need, I really would love to see them return to this idea of a consistent threat that is, you can't kill it. 
it's always there over your shoulder until the very end. I, I think that I think that's a really good, cool. I, think, I was just going to say, I think that's a good idea. And I, I think we need a through line villain as well mm-hmm. in the same vein as Wesker, somebody who's not going to show up in one game and die like uh, Mother Miranda does or something like that. So, But Mother Miranda was controlling everything the whole time. Yeah, but we didn't know she existed until... Till the end. Till the end. So Don't worry. Wesker will come back in nine. Let's talk about uh, music here, which I don't think there's... I actually do have some things to say, um, okay. but not I, a I lot. I really struggled with this one. Again, similar co-op complaint of just... We were talking most of the time, so I'm not... Hearing the music, we did compliment on Jake's credits theme, whatever that was. That was about all I remember. I just think out. that this nothing about this soundtrack feels Resident Evil. Yeah, at all. Like that was my big takeaway. Like I was, I, I told you, like, oh, this theme song sounds like something ripped out of Batman: Arkham City. Like, uh, which does not mean it has like Batman or superhero vibes. It more just like it's going for like an orchestral type of big booming orchestral score which again I, other or other resident evil games obviously have too but there's the other resident evil soundtracks are more i feel like the the scores are more specific and like like there's always an earworm or two in each of the resident evil games i feel like and uh in this game it's just going for big booming action set pieces more than anything else and uh yeah. I felt like that was even seen with the the music here. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a weird soundtrack for a, for a weird game. Yeah, it, it, it complements it in the weirdness, but it, it, there's nothing there's nothing I would want to go back to. And I think that's the bummer here because at least the other games have themes that stand out or, or ride with the series. So. It just doesn't feel like a Resident Evil soundtrack. Like that's my biggest yeah. critique. Like again, it, does it match with what's happening on screen and what's happening um in the story and stuff? Like sure. Again, they're trying to go for a big summer action blockbuster type approach here it feels like, but it just that's not that's not Resident Evil. And even with mm-hmm. 5 when they were going in that direction, 5 still felt like it had music that was more in common with what we had seen in the previous games. So, yeah. I would agree. What's this game's legacy? I feel like it's a very simple one in some ways. This is just the bad Resident Evil. Yeah, it really, it's the game that caused Capcom to reconsider the direction of the series. It leads to Seven and Village and partially these remakes. It it helped, in a hindsight way, it helped revitalize the series by nearly killing the main line not that you know resident evil was going to stay around but think about other games that came out around this time i think operation raccoon city was similarly mm-hmm. close also not so great like the series was on a decline and then that caused capcom to reconsider and then ultimately revitalize the series bring it back to life like a zombie in a good way so it's that it's the last as we stand co-op game. It's the last, you know, only two real co-op entries, but it is the last of those and it's the last time we've seen Leon. Uh, we've seen Chris since, but mm-hmm. not Leon. So and Ada, I guess we haven't seen Ada. Chris is the Chris is the only character that I mean Chris is kind of I've said this before in this season, but Chris is kind of like the main character of Resident Evil. In a lot he's of in one. He's in. He's in one. He's in the he's new. I mentioned mean, he's, in two. He's mentioned in three. He's teased he's at the three. end of three remake. Even he's in Code Veronica. Mm-hmm. He's in five. He's in six. He's in seven, and he's in eight. He yeah. is the guy. Which is so funny. Like you would think Leon is, but Leon's only been in. Lance not been in that many games. He's in three. Yeah. He's been in two, four, and six. Yeah. And then mentioned in like a couple others, but yeah. Weird. Jill and Leon have the same count, I think. And they're like the two most popular. <laughs> one wait, one, three, and Revelations, re- I guess. Yeah. Which doesn't really count. The one other thing I want to say here is like 
credit to Capcom though with this game. Um, even though this is the bad one in the series, you mentioned that this is kind of the turning point for the series and it kind of set up what would come next. Credit to Capcom for not seeing the sales for this game, you know, and it doing well for their standards and saying, okay, cool, like this game is selling commercially well. Let's ignore the reviews and push further in this direction. Like they listen more to the even though sales were high, they took the criticism from critics and fans to heart and were like, okay, we gotta, we've lost ourselves. We've lost what the series is and we need to go back to the drawing board and we need to find a new way forward, um, which they did excellently with seven. Um, and I really think a lot of other publishers nowadays, like at the time we're recording this, like Activision, for instance, uh, like, like just one quick example, like Activision this year in 2023 was planning not to release a Call of Duty game at one point it was reported. And then it was said that, oh no, they're actually going to release an expansion for, uh, Modern Warfare 2. And then that expansion blew up into like a premium Call of Duty title, which like people didn't know what that meant. And now... It's gone so far as they're, they're, the new reports are like they're flat out releasing Modern Warfare 3 this year. <laughs> so I guess what, what I'm saying is like, yeah, Modern Warfare 3 is this year, supposedly. No Russian, baby. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I guess my point there is just that like, we're in a, and this game obviously released 10 years ago, but we're in a time where publishers feel like they're chasing money more than anything else. And I guess looking back at this game with... 11 years of hindsight and seeing that the money was there, but the critical response wasn't. And that was enough for Capcom to go change things. Mm -hmm. It says a lot nowadays in an environment where I'm not sure that would happen anymore, you know, because like mm -hmm. modern warfare two, again, with the Activision example, people are disappointed with that game. It didn't live up to expectations. And what is Activision's response? Well, here's another one. We know you'll buy it. You buy it every year. So like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of impressive to look back at what Capcom did with this game. And they're like, oh, people bought it, but they don't like it. So we need to prompt some change here rather than just doing more of this. Um, because feasibly, people would have bought seven if they would have kind of done new things in this same vein um, rather than giving us the version of seven that we got. So Yeah. Total props to them for listening and making the changes and honestly it leads honestly it has led to a better overall franchise well i was gonna say it's led to the most profitable <laughs> critically respond like like them choosing to do that has led to resident evil being bigger than ever more profitable yeah. than ever like that was and that, that and that just shows that like if you put quality above everything else like the sales will be there I think that does it for Resident Evil 6. We did it. We've played all the mainline games. It feels kind of good to be there. We It feels really one, good. Yeah. We have one more episode this season, the Resident Evil 4 remake. Logan's actually been playing it lately, and I'm already done with it. So that episode will be next here for Chapter Select. But thank you so much for listening to us talk about Resident Evil 6. If you'd like to find our other seasons or more information about the show, you can head over to chapterselect.com or follow the show at Chapter Select. If you'd like to follow Logan, you can do so at Moreman12 and his writing over at comicbook.com. You can find myself at MaxRoberts143 and my writing over at maxfrequency.net. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to the show. You know, I haven't I haven't done this before, but maybe you know, leave us a review in your podcast app of choice or, or maybe like and subscribe if you're on YouTube or, you know, just subscribe to the show here in your podcast player it would mean a lot to the both of us. But thank you all so much for listening and joining us here as we get ready to end season five. And until next time, adios. Chapter Select is a Max Frequency production. This episode was researched, produced, and edited by me, Max Roberts. Season 5 is hosted by Logan Moore and myself. Season 5 is all about Resident Evil. For more on this season, go to chapterselect.com forward slash season 5. Follow the show at Chapter Select and check out previous seasons at chapterselect.com.